Okay. I am so excited for this conversation. Me too. <laughs> so um, so uh, I wanted to start uh, by, you notice that we said former state senator, Hannah Beth Jackson. So if you could just start by giving us a brief introduction to yourself, your extraordinary work. Uh, we only have you know, uh, tw about 20 minutes, so maybe not all of the legislation. Um, and, then, um, and then what are your current role? Great. So uh, California has term limits, and I had served the full 14 years, eight, uh, six in the Assembly, uh, and then this past, the past eight years in the State Senate. So now I am not only a recovering lawyer, I am a recovering legislator. Uh, having been a lawyer for tw and practiced law for 22 years before I got into politics. Uh, during my tenure, I uh, really focused on issues affecting the environment, uh, work, uh, women, equity, um, education. And during my uh, tenure as a state senator, I uh, wrote the first, or I should say, the strongest equal pay bill uh, back in 2015, which talked about equal pay for uh, substantially similar work. We had equal pay in the books since 1949, but the courts had uh, determined equal had to be exactly the same, and of course, uh, that created and helped to skew uh, women's uh, value at work. Now, there are now 42 other states that are using that law as a template for their own states. The California effect. The California effect, <laughs> and of course, uh, in 2018, I uh, wrote legislation that the governor signed that yeah, I call my really poke the bear legislation, <laughs> uh, which requires that California's publicly traded companies uh, must add women uh, and diversity to their corporate boards. And um, I had no idea that, I, I knew that there were, the, the boardroom might be a little shaken up, but uh, today there are now three or four or five lawsuits that have been filed, none, by the way, by any California company impacted by this, but by shareholders who live in Chicago, Illinois, by a Texas membership company, a couple taxpayers. Um, so I'm having great fun as we follow that or that <laughs> litigation along. And I'm currently, um, uh, put out a shingle and I'm do pro uh, doing professional um, uh, strategic advising and consulting, and it's great fun that people are actually uh, paying for my opinions. Um, <laughs> my daughter says, really, nobody cares about your opinion, but I've been proving her wrong. Uh, and um, working with some companies, trying to uh, advance greater equity uh, in the workplace, and also helping to do visioning uh, and strategic advising for the future, because uh, we are at that um, that uh, precipice right now where we can either continue to fall off a cliff or move forward, uh, and that's exciting work as well. Well, thank you so much. Now, I'd like to uh, focus our discussion on the legislation that did, as you say, poke the bear, um, go bears. Um, and, uh, but before I do that, you know, you have uh, authored, you know, the, uh, as you said, the, the equal pay bill and all sorts of other legislation. Why did this one poke the bear, do you think? Well, the corporate boardroom, I believe, has been sort of the last bastion of white male control. And, you know, nobody gives up power control easily. Uh, and so directing this effort to require that we expand or that we open the corporate boardroom to other decision makers with other life experience, bringing different perspective, different values to the table, really I think was a threat uh, to some very powerful people. I mean, I think of the uh, Atlanta, the golf club there where the Masters is played. Look at the battle they put up uh, when there was an effort to sort of integrate the club by allowing women to be members. Uh, when you get to that high level of corporate uh, or power, uh, when you start challenging it, really does uh, raise quite a furor. And I think, frankly, that's what this bill did. Okay, so can you, for those of us in the audience who are not closely following what the bill mandates, what? Can, you, can, oh, can, can you just unpack that for us briefly? Sure. This is a bill that required, by the end of uh, 2019, uh, that there be at least one woman on a corporate board 
of a publicly traded company headquartered in California that had uh, a board of five or fewer. You had to have at least one. And as of the end of this year, if you're a board of more than five, you have to have at least three women on your board. Uh, women, we're not talking about uh, race, we're just saying you need to add women to your corporate boards. And uh, it, there is a penalty, uh, an incentive, we're trying to create this by natural progression, uh, that if you don't, that the Secretary of State of California, who collects the data, uh, which is why the Secretary of State is the enforcement agency, uh, has the ability to fine a company uh, $100,000 uh, for each violation uh, of that law. And right now, we haven't seen uh, any uh, fines at this point. In fact, in great measure, because most companies in California are adding women to their boards uh, voluntarily. Uh, they're also adding them because some of the big investment companies are saying, we're not going to fund companies that don't have this diversity because we know this diversity adds value, which uh, Mr. Johnson said, <laughs> and I'm going to hold him to that statement. You said you wanted an affidavit, I think. I think <laughs> I want an affidavit from him as to that effect, uh, because it is true that there are been studies done by McKenzie, Goldman Sachs, um, uh, Berkeley did a study. Uh, and actually, that's the reason that this legislation uh, had such legs to it, is because there is clearly demonstrated value by having that diverse input into corporate decision making. OK, well, thank you for that. I wanted to, um, you touched upon the private sector, you know, NASDAQ now requiring uh, diversity uh, in order to list, and so many other efforts and shareholder proposals by investors. Why do we need regulation? For those, you know, for those of us who say, yes, board diversity is a good thing, let's let uh, private ordering address this as it has been doing. Why do we need well, regulation? Well, you know, we tried that. Uh, back in 2013, I did legislation as a resolution. Resolution has no force and effect of law, but it's just something to advise, to counsel, to recommend. So I did a bill back in 2013 urging uh, California's corporations to add women. And there had been a number of studies done which demonstrated the efficacy and the value, uh, not only to profitability, but productivity, governance, transparency, uh, workforce uh, interaction and relations. Uh, and in 2013, we uh, got this resolution passed with bipartisan support, uh, probably 50 seven or maybe 67 of 80 assembly members and probably 30, 32 of the 40 uh, senators agreed that this was worthy of considering. Um, the number of women who held corporate board seats, about 15.5% of all corporate board seats held in these California companies were held by women. Fast forward five years later when I said, how are we doing? We had moved uh, the um, needle up from 15.5% to 16%. It's progress. Well, at that rate, it would take, what, 100 years to get any level of parity. So it was very clear that by asking, by showing the value, we were really not making any kind of a dent. So in 2018, I did this legislation that requires that boards in California uh, perform accordingly. OK, so asking nicely didn't. Really. Asking nicely didn't do okay. a whole lot. Okay. Um, so, you know, you cite a lot of reports and data uh, on the link between diversity and financial uh, growth and resilience and long term profitability. Um, there's a lot of reports and data on the other side of that as well. Um, are, you know, what, what say you to the other? Well, to, well, the, to the when you are looking at data that is being prepared by the Heritage Foundation and other organizations which have a clear ideological prism through which they um, analyze data, and then you look at work that's done by Morgan Stanley uh, International uh, Capital, um, Credit Suisse, uh, who are some of the others, Berkeley, and a couple of other uh, organizations that are clearly uh, more business oriented. They're not ideological. Uh, and they say this is very beneficial, but you get uh, uh, a, an organization that is ideologically extraordinarily 
conservative, I guess is the politest way I can say it, you have to ask, you know, they, they, they used to say, you know, with data, garbage in, garbage out. I mean, you can choose your data. But for, for my perspective, when you have an objective uh, organization, Credit Suisse, I mean, as somebody tell me that they're ultra left wing, I'd be very shocked to hear that. They aren't. I mean, they look at the data from a business perspective. Their data, their reports, their studies show that th having this diversity is good for business. And when you think about it as a practical matter, women are 70% of the consumers of all the goods and pro uh, services that we have. So we're the purchasers. Um, having women at the table making those decisions, bringing our life experience to the table um, is an added value. We also know that when you bring women uh, to the decision making process, it has actually changed uh, the behavior in the boardroom. Why? Well, because when women come, have come to the table, they are fully prepared this is not the guys getting together, um, uh, drinking good scotch and expensive cigars. They come to the table ready to work. And so it has forced a lot of the men to do their homework too, because they don't want to be shine, you know, outshined by the, the girls in the room. Uh, and so we know from these studies uh, that clearly adding this diversity uh, is a benefit to the corporate bottom line and the governance of these companies. I've been known to enjoy scotch. I'm, I'm not going to talk no about complaints. cigars. Let's move the on. The cigars, I don't know, but no, no. <laughs> but, but it's sort of been an, a, a good old boys network where the decision making about who you bring onto the board, first of all, is it done in, in secret? And you don't even know who's being considered, uh, whether or not there's an opening. And frequently what happens is the, the you know, we, we know the people we know through our networks. And as men have, uh, networked in sort of a, a male-dominated isolation, uh, women aren't even considered because they're not part of that network. If we open up the networks, what we've discovered too is when you add women to these boards, women networking with other women can recommend uh, high quality, upper management, middle management people, thus expanding the experience of the organization itself. It's a win-win. Okay, so in our last few minutes, I wanted to pivot to uh, the legal challenges. Um, I know you can't get into too much detail on those challenges, but you know, what has surprised you? Where do you think this litigation is headed? What are your thoughts? Well, we were warned early on that there, there was a good chance that it would be challenged. You know, anytime you make change, anytime you challenge uh, major long-standing institutions, somebody's not going to be happy. Um, so uh, after these, uh, uh, after the bill was was passed and signed by the governor, and there was some surprise. Uh, let me share with you. Uh, it so happened that this was the uh, last day that the governor could sign bills. He waited until the very last day, whether he was going to sign or veto this bill. Uh, it just so happened that it was the Sunday right after the Kavanaugh hearings. And his wife, who was a very successful businesswoman in her own right, and the governor's then chief of staff, who was a very successful um, upper management person, I think in PG&E for several years, happened to be watching those hearings. And the governor was not very happy with what he saw in the United States um, Judiciary Committee, uh, almost exclusively men. Uh, the discussion was, if you watched them, was clearly rancorous and had some real issues, gender issues associated with it. So he signed this bill and he said this is essentially a shot across the bow of the male dominated corporate world. And that's exactly what it did. And so we've seen litigation. Uh, uh, one suit filed by Judicial Watch, one suit filed uh, by the Pacific Legal uh, Foundation, very, very conservative uh, organizations. As I mentioned, the, the uh, plaintiffs in these lawsuits, none of them are California corporations.
very important factor. It says that you have to have at least three. Why three? Well, for many of us who have been in a room where we've been the only woman, we're frequently expected either to take the notes or get the coffee. Uh, if there are two women, uh, we're supposed to decide between the two of us who's going to get the coffee. But if there are three women in a room, we look at the guys and we say, get your own damn coffee. And so that's what they call the critical mass. And we know that y y it's true. Uh, when you are in that circumstance, when you have a critical mass, uh, the voice of those uh, women, that critical mass, is more likely to be heard. We reinforce each other. Uh, because there are more than one of us uh, frequently dealing with similar issues of being interrupted or mansplained or our comments not even being acknowledged as they go on to some other topic. I mean, this is all, there's data that shows all this. So those are the basic issues in the lawsuit. One of the suits comes to trial theoretically early December. Um, there were requests for preliminary injunctions made both in the state and the federal case, both of which were denied. Uh, so that these cases are moving forward and um, I'm confident that we will prevail. And uh, even if we don't prevail, we're seeing the market move. Um, and someone said, well, why then don't you withdraw the law? You know, it's the analogy is if you're a race car driver and you're driving in a race, you don't take your foot off the gas pedal when you see the finish line. You keep driving until you get to pass the finish line. And that's what we're doing here. And we hope, of course, you mentioned NASDAQ, um, uh, Goldman Sachs, uh, companies like BlackRock, Vanguard, uh, State Street, they are now all taking the position that they, want, they only are going to uh, do business with companies that have that diversity because it's good for business. It's good for the shareholder. It's good for the company. Uh, and uh, it is a meaningful, hopefully a shift, um, as Mr. Johnson was saying, uh, one that will benefit everyone in the long term. So in your, um, I'm going to pivot to your current um, role, consulting and advising companies and getting paid to, to, wow. to offer your opinion. What a notion. Um, what has surprised you uh, the most uh, with respect to your, how your clients are approaching diversity? Well, um, that level of uncertainty, um, you know, change is hard to make. Sometimes people say, better the devil you know than the devil you don't know. Uh, but, there, but there is, I think, a willingness to consider uh, going forward in this post-pandemic world uh, the best way to do business, what's going to be best for your employees, what's going to be uh, best for the ultimate um, success of the company. How do we make this work? And there is some agreement uh, but there is a lot of uncertainty and disagreement. So, for example, Mr. Johnson mentioned the notion of remote work. Uh, this is something where companies are beginning to realize that you don't necessarily, you aren't necessarily most effective driving into work every day, that we can have some flexible work time. But there are some problems with the whole issue of family leave, for example, and childcare, recognizing the needs that parents have. How do we address that problem? And I think what we need to do is recognize that there are uh, needs that families have that have to be accommodated and that employers are a place where they can demonstrate that leadership, which is different than the way corporations have thought, I think, uh, generally speaking, uh, mm -hmm. throughout our corporate history. Um, okay, so in the last couple of minutes that we have, so you heard yesterday that some academics don't do magic wands. I, I do magic wands and crystal balls. Oh, good. I do both. So, <laughs> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a magic wand and ask you if you could change anything uh, in order to advance uh, gender diversity, what would that change? And you could change two things. If you well, I, I think uh, I'm a big fan of B Corps. Uh, I'm a big fan of the notion that, you know, corp we're a capitalist society. And capitalism, by its very nature, is an amoral system. Uh, so that's why regulation becomes important, because a capitalist company is driven by profit. That's what they're there to do. What the government does is to try to put some parameters 
on businesses. And I think that B corporations are one of the ways that corporations can do this themselves. And I agree uh, in almost all the work I did and almost all the legislation that I uh, drafted and, and passed, I would bring the opposition in and I would say, these are my values, this is what I want to accomplish. Can you help me get there? Can you help me get there in a way that it works for you and still accomplishes the goals that I'm uh, identifying? And I think uh, if we had companies uh, that could and believe that their responsibility is to people, planet, and profits. I think that would make for a better world. I think that would adva advance a lot of our concerns about things like uh, uh, our climate crisis. If we had to take some responsibility as, as corporations for the future of our planet and the next generations, uh, I'd like to see us doing more and more of that. And I do believe if you bring women onto those boards, uh, we get that different perspective that I think will advance that cause. So that's really an important one to me. Um, and I have in my district, uh, I represent Santa Barbara and Ventura counties, uh, a company you may all have heard of called Patagonia. And Patagonia is a B Corp. Now, it's also privately owned. Right. But if we could do more of that and use that as an example, they, by the way, have had on-site childcare at Patagonia for 40 years. 40 years. And when you talk to the owners, they tell you it's a moneymaker. They, their people don't leave. In fact, they're now in their second and third generation of employees uh, because they know how important this is. And their workers, having their young children on site, uh, they are more relaxed. They're more focused on their work. They get their jobs done in uh, less time because they have other responsibilities and they can know, know that they can do them with less stress which I know we were, uh, was not mentioned, but I know the, the women in this room who, and men too, who have families, feeling that stress really can get in the way of uh, uh, job performance and your life experience. Okay, so last parting gift, the crystal ball. Where are we headed? Are you hopeful with all this litigation pending? Uh... Well, I'm an optimist. I just feel as I have to be in order to keep going on and my, my hope and expectation is that as we discuss where we need to go in this post-pandemic world, we're gonna talk about things like job flexibility, like paid family leave, like adding greater diversity, gender, racial, ethnic. We need to come together as a society. We need to do more to recognize that we are interdependent. We need to do more to recognize our planet is at risk. Right now, we have droughts, we have fires. I mean, the dramatic changes in weather have got to impact us, and we need to respond. So it's my hope that we're going to do that and somehow overcome our political differences to recognize that we all are part of the same humanity. And if we do that, we will be successful. If we don't, then we will fail, and I think we will put the next generations at risk. Thank you. Thank you so much for your leadership and for your time today with My us. My pleasure.